assistant professor now at University of Michigan in the School of Information. And she, previous to that, she had done some work at HB Labs. Uh, a lot of her research is sort of in the intersection of stuff relating to networks, dynamics, and information. And so today she's going to be talking about the dynamics of information in online forums, which sort of nicely sort of captures a lot of things she's been thinking about for a while. Yeah, OK. Um, so this is joint, thank you, thank you. Um, so this is joint work with uh, Mark Ackerman and several of our students. And I'll start out with some motivation. The motivation is that lots of people are turning to online question and answer forums um, to seek information that they want to know about. Um, so rather than just so using a search engine, they'll go to a forum, uh, post a question, and actually expect humans to answer their question in particular. And this works. Uh, even though most of these systems are actually uh, completely free, right? so you don't pay in order to get your answer. So this is a quote from the CEO of Naver, which runs Knowledge In, the Korean question answer forum. And he says, knowledge search is like oozing out knowledge in human brains to the internet. People who know something better than others can present their know-how, skills, or knowledge. And um, what I'm going to try and get at in this talk is whether we can figure out how much they know and whether they know more than other people do, right? Because this will allow us to kind of evaluate their responses. Another reason besides uh, being able to infer the reliability of the answers, for example, by knowing the expertise level of the replier, it may also be good to know the expertise level of the asker. So. In Sun's Java forum, if an expert user asks a question, it can take hours to days for that question to get a response. If a newbie asks a question, usually there's a response within an hour, right? So, and the way that the questions are shown is most recent first. So you have this flood of newbie questions. And it could be that simply the few experts who would be able to answer this question haven't really had it brought to their attention. So if we could automatically infer that this was a question from an expert, we could route it to other experts. Similarly, you might not always want the top level expert to be replying to a newbie, because they might say something like, well, you know, just read the manual or read the documentation, right? Versus if someone has to just learn the material, they might take more time to answer step by step how to approach the problem. So this, these are just some reasons why we might want to know what the expertise level of the users is. And the methodology that we use is essentially network analysis. And others have applied network analysis to online forums. Mark Smith and his collaborators have looked at things like Usenet and identified answer people, people who just sit around <laughs> and answer lots of questions or make lots of responses, um, question people, people who um, who ask a lot. Um, also, people have studied different mo motivations in online participation. In particular, is there a higher likelihood that you're going to come back if when you first post, you get a reply, things of that sort. There are lots of expertise recommenders, lots of systems built, especially this is now popular within largest organizations. You have all of this expertise. Um, can you, uh, by querying, identify who within your company might know about something? And then in order to do that, you might want to automatically evaluate expertise levels by mining things like documents and email. There has also recently been a lot of work specifically looking at online question answer forums. Um, Max Harper and Joe Constant and others at the University of Minnesota have two CHI papers. In the first one, they looked at whether um, you should be paying for your answers. That is, systems like Google Answers, which is now defunct, where you would offer some money in order for a vetted expert to reply, whether that gets you a better answer than a system like Yahoo Answers, where there's no payment involved. And it turns out that yes, but you would still prefer Yahoo Answers to say a free system where you only allow some uh, users to participate, um, you know, kind of the vetted experts and not just open up the system. It turns out that. Um, a system where everyone can reply typically yields better answers. And then this year at CHI, um, they looked at automatically identifying question types. This is something that will come up 
um, in a little bit, and that is that people aren't always seeking factual information. So if you can tell what kind of question is um, coming in, you can better archive it or even um, try and route it um, to appropriate answers. Uh, Eugene Achchein at Emory and his collaborators have um, evaluated a whole bunch of ways of identifying good content, including figuring out things such as good answers tend to uh, be paired with good questions. So even having a rating system for questions can be, can be helpful. And then there are other approaches that have also applied uh, network analysis. So I'll start out with our first study, which was of Sun's Java Forum. And uh, we had you know, over a million messages and 200,000 users and lots of relationships between them. And the way that we constructed the relationships was from threaded discussions. So say A posts a question, thread one, and then B replies. What we're going to do is we're going to uh, draw an edge from A to B, meaning if you answer my question, then uh, I'm going to link to you because you're more expert than I am because you're able to answer my question. We can do this in an unweighted fashion. We also try different weighting schemes. If uh, you reply to me twice, right, maybe the edge should have weight two. If two people replied, maybe you should only get half the credit for that particular question. Um, even the backflow edge, so if you even bother to reply to my question, that gives me some credit, meaning that, you know, at least I could ask a decent question. Um, it turns out that the simple unweighted network worked just as well as these others, so that's what um, I'll be discussing. If you look at the, this is, this is the cumulative degree distribution. Um, so this is how many other users a user helped. You can see that many users helped, um, you know, one person, and even though it's not displayed, many helped none at all. Um, but a few were helping, you know, over a thousand others. There's some that also received help from lots of others, but typically this heavy tail is for the repliers. And if you just look at, this is a tiny fragment of the Java forum. These are the heavy repliers. The color indicates if it's red that mostly they reply, they don't um, ask. And so you have a few central players who are then um, answering all of these um, questions. Okay, so given the structure of that network, can we actually use it to infer the expertise level? And we tried simple things such as just looking at the number of posts or the number of people that you reply to. Um, Z-scores for those two, for example, do you reply more than you ask? Uh, or do you help more people than there are people who help you? And we also tried things like page rank, right? The intuition there is uh, maybe you helped me but someone who helps you maybe should have an even higher score because they're helping someone who already has a certain expertise level. And then the HITS algorithm would reinforce. So if there are people who are asking good questions, they would boost the score of those who replied to them, and that would kind of get propagated back and forth and reinforced. So in order to figure out, you know, do any of these kind of automated methods work, um, we got human raters, so people who are really expert in Java, to read through the posts of several of these users and rate them on a scale of one, complete newbie, to five, top Java expert. And we got okay inter-rater agreement, and what was even kind of more surprising to us is that pretty much any method we chose was pretty good, or as good as the raters were in agreeing with one another. That's how good the automated method was in agreeing with the raters. Basically, if you just look at the number of posts, the most active posters are the ones that the humans rated as being most expert, right? And somewhat surprising and disappointing to us was that PageRank, here shown in purple, didn't really seem to do better than the z-scores. Um, which are shown here in, in red and in green, right? So the simpler metric uh, picked up more than, than PageRank did. And so we're unhappy about this for a while, and then Jun Zhang actually constructed a simulator. And what we could do with the simulator in the simulation would be to 
see what the underlying dynamics might be and see how the algorithms behave in order to try and figure out what's really going on in the Java forum. So what we could do is we could determine what the distribution of expertise is. Do you have relatively few experts, lots of newbies? Who's asking the questions? Well, probably more often it's the newbies than the experts. And then given that a user of a given expertise level has posted a question, who's going to be answering? And we had two different modes. In the uh, best preferred, you wanted the expertise level of the replier to be as far above the expertise level of the asker as possible. So if you have that most of the questions are asked by the newbies, that's why most of it is kind of down here, um, you still have the top level experts doing most of the replying. The other choice is that people are kind of more conservative of their time. So the top level experts are only going to want to tackle the challenging questions and the people who have sufficient expertise are going to pick the, again, the questions that they can answer. And in this case, again, you have that the newbies are asking most of the questions, but here it's the level twos now who are answering most of them, right? Because they can answer the level one questions. And this leads to different network topologies. So this is still the simulation. So in the best preferred, basically, and, and here the size reflects the expertise, right? All of these questions are being answered by the experts, and the experts kind of drift to the center of the network if you just let the network kind of, if you do an automated layout. Here in the just better, you can see that the questions are kind of going next level up when they're getting answered. And the experts are almost kind of drifting to the periphery of the network, right? Because they're only answering, the level fives are answering level fours, right? And um, it's the kind of newbies who are in the center. And this leads to different degree correlation profiles. So in the real Java forum network, um, what you have on the x-axis is how many uh, people the, ask, the helper has helped before, and on the y-axis, how many people the asker has helped before. And you see that it's um, kind of dark over here, meaning that um, it's the, the helpers have actually helped a lot of others before. And this gives you, it actually gives you a, a zero overall degree correlation for each kind of um, helper helpee relationship, you look at how many people has this person helped, how many people has this person helped, and the overall correlation is zero, which is what we get again in the simulation as well when we have the top level experts always answering. On the other hand, this is what the just better degree correlation looks like, and here you get a positive correlation, right, because people of similar expertise levels are helping each other. So we kind of got the, the simulation to match the observed. And what's even better is that we can explain now why these algorithms work like they do. So the colors have switched a bit, so I apologize. But the yellow is page rank. And you can see how it's not doing, well, it's definitely not doing better than, say, z-score or in-degree, right? And that's because you have the top level experts are always answering, and so they get high degree, right? And so they're very easy to identify, just as they are in the real forum. On the other hand, we can see how these algorithms would behave if we had kind of a more expertise matching dynamic in the forum. And in this case, the yellow, the page rank, is doing much better because, in fact, you do have the level fives helping the level threes, the level threes helping the level ones. And so when you propagate the scores, you correctly identify the experts. I'm sorry, yeah. Could you just um, explain, explain again what it is that's being charted on these, these correlation? Yeah, so so previously we had the human raters versus, you know, reading the posts in the Java forum, and then we had just something that counts the in degree or calculates the page rank. Here, since it's a simulation, we've basically set the expertise level for each node, 
And then we run the simulation, which basically simulates questions and answers being generated. And then we try to see whether our algorithms can infer what that expertise level was that we assigned in the first place. So the bars are how correlated the automated method is with the human rankers? Well, in this case, uh, the, the assigned expertise in the simulation. Because we don't, we don't, I mean, we don't actually have, we haven't yet encountered a scenario where people really are conservative of their time and are trying to match expertise. But through the simulation, you know, we're ready. We know that PageRank could, uh, could pick them out. Yeah. And how did you set the distribution of expertise in the simulation? So we tried either uniform or kind of power law-ish, very skewed, just a bit more realistic. Mm -hmm. So just the overall idea, idea, I guess, is you're going to, is it like this sort of a profile of algorithm performance and you're going to see, well, this is how the algorithms perform on the Java form and depending which profile it matches better, that is what the underlying model must be for the Java form? Yeah, I, I think we're pretty confident. It, it wasn't that hard to figure out kind of after the fact that the dynamic in the Java form is that, I mean, so, so June actually went and he interviewed a couple of these top participants and said, you know, really, you, you sit around there and you answer all these questions? And they were like, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, kind of after the fact, it was like, okay, yeah, th that, that is the dynamic, but yeah. Mm -hmm. would, would they prefer a system that you know, ranked the questions so they could answer the expert questions first? If you put that into the forum mechanism? So that would be an interesting experiment to, to do. So we, we had, let's see, is this, yeah, so um, June actually put together kind of an interface that was never tested, but that in principle could do that. So the user would select, you know, I want questions that are challenging to me versus questions that are newer versus, but yeah, we didn't, we didn't find out. And in the, I don't know if I'll have time, but in the last study I wanted to describe, we asked users in the Korean question answer form, and they actually really enjoyed tackling easy questions. It just gave them, you know, the satisfaction of getting things done and they could do it quickly. So, not, not sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think for, for Java form, you do encounter a lot of, we don't, we don't know whether people searched and they just already found the answer, right? We only observe if they reposted it. And at least in, in Java forum, a lot of times people will say, well, look at this earlier thread, okay. you know, it's already been resolved. But some of the other forums, not necessarily people are happy to answer over and over again. So, okay. So, um, with Java Forum, we said, hey, look, uh, we can't go wrong. No matter what metric we use, we can identify the experts. Uh, great. And um, we felt pretty invincible at that point, so we decided to tackle something much bigger, which was Yahoo Answers. And we kind of learned a lesson, <laughs> which was that in Yahoo Answers, we had lots of difficulty and basically never really succeeded in successfully applying these uh, these metrics to identify the experts. But what we thought the initial challenge was going to be was figuring out things such as, you know, if you have an expert in car maintenance and repair, how is that going to translate to whether they're an expert in, say, giving hair advice? Or, you know, are they going to be someone who needs, needs to get hair advice or something like that? So we kind of looked at it from that perspective. And because Yahoo Answers was so diverse, there are actually all sorts of different questions. So you might understand why someone would post uh, a question about Java, right? They just encountered some syntax error and they don't understand it and they post it to the forum and it gets resolved, right? But people are asking about all sorts of other things and sometimes it's because they can't spell, especially in a foreign language. Sometimes it's just common sense knowledge, like what would happen if I left the racks in my oven when I turned the clean cycle on, right? And so the manufacturer 
is going to give you, you know, a manual that says, like, don't do it. And probably online resources are also going to say, don't do it. But probably someone has done it, you know, intentionally or unintentionally, and kind of can tell you what, what happens when you do that. Um, sometimes what people are really looking for is not so much factual advice, even though it might sound like it, right? Sometimes they're looking for support. So if they're asking how to get rid of their fear of bees, they might be comforted by answers that say, oh, that's a normal fear to have. I have that too. And then maybe some practical advice as well. And then finally, you just have things that are really prompts for discussion. They're, they're questions, right? Have conservatives been good for the US? Right? But no one's really expecting kind of factual content to follow. So again, we collected a large data set, um, 8 million answers to about a million questions. And I know it's going to be impossible to decipher, but this is a tree map of all the top level and second level categories in Yahoo. And the size of, um, a square indicates how many questions were posted, and the color indicates, on average, how many answers were posted for each question. And so you have religion and spirituality, for example, garnering lots of answers per question, but there are these dark areas of computers and internet and science and math. Right. And so before you dismiss it as, you know, people don't like to talk about those things, it's, it's more, I believe, that these are more factual questions so that once someone gives an answer, there's not really uh, a reason to keep going on and on versus you might imagine in subjects like religion, people can go on and on. And uh, I'll just point out there's a really bright area here. This is baby names. And then there's a really bright area there in science and math. And we'll see what that is. So first of all, baby names. Now you can see why lots of people can answer, right? Basically, they're expressing their opinion about a particular name. And this is the science. This is alternative science that people like to give lots of answers to. And so this, this kind of corresponds to the, you know, if it's not factual, right, people can, can keep going. So they're happy to talk about ghosts and the paranormal and, and so on. OK, so given this wide variety of categories, can we start um, grouping them by user behavior? So the first two dimensions we look at is the length of the reply, the length of the answer. And some things, when people are talking about cancer or history, they tend to um, give longer answers than, for example, when they're talking about baby names, in which case they might just say, I like it or I don't like it, or even things like wrestling. So wrestling is the WWF. So a lot of this is kind of discussion, you know, who's going to win tomorrow and not really kind of stats. Um, and so uh, that's two dimensions. The, the third dimension that we used was the overlap between, you know, who the people are who ask and who the people are who reply. And for Categories such as programming, this overlap is very low. So the people who are there answering questions are not the ones who are asking. And this is even lower in forums such as Yahoo Answers than in forums such as Java Forum, where even the kind of experts also tend to ask sometime. Then you have these categories that are mixed, kind of factual and support, such as marriage, uh, where you have a little bit more overlap and also a higher. So the thread length is the number of replies per, per question. And then you have wrestling all the way um, out here where lots of people both ask and reply. And uh, so this is just a factual category looking kind of like the Java forum, so botany, right? The, the nodes that are larger are the ones who are replying a lot, and they're, they're also redder, meaning that they're replying rather than asking. And uh, my student, Eitan Bakshi, created these plots. Mark Smith now calls them Bakshi plots. Um, these are sampled ego networks, so a particular individual and the, the others that they interacted with, so this person uh, posted a question and got a bunch of replies. This person replied to a bunch of others. And so this is programming. This is marriage and divorce. And this is wrestling. So what you can see is that progressively you have more of the people that you interact with interacting with each other. Right? In programming, that's not the case. Here, there's a little. 
and here there's most, yeah? Yes. Yeah. Um, so these are kind of sample, sorry, I should have said, these are sample categories from each cluster. So there was the clustering, as you could see, it was kind of, it had to chop somewhere. It was more of a continuum. And so programming, marriage, wrestling were ones that were very consistently in three separate clusters, which is why they were chosen. Um, and so this is, uh, Mark Smith kind of likes to joke about this, that this is how you know that, um, oh, sorry, that marriage is um, more like wrestling than like programming, right? So you can see the ego nets. Okay, so given that there are all these different categories, you might wonder how do they interact, right? At the beginning, I said, well, what if people who give car advice go and ask for hair advice? Now, this is really not what goes on. Um, but you do have, for example, people who give travel advice also often ask about local businesses and dining out and food and drink, right? So these are kind of the enjoy life people. And so even though they can give, give answers about various travel questions, they also often ask, you know, possibly as they're traveling. Um, and then you have other categories where really you don't have much kind of exchange of expertise with, um, with other categories. Okay, so the categories are kind of related and the users are somehow deciding, you know, where they want to uh, share their expertise. And one measure that we wanted to develop, and this is something that Mark Newman at the University of Michigan helped out with, was to figure out, you know, how focused people are or, convert, or you know, kind of the opposite is um, how high their uh, entropy is. So since we have these categories, we just took the entropy, that is, we just take the proportion of their answers that are in each category, and then we calculate the entropy from that. And we do the same thing for the subcategories. And basically people with higher entropy are going to be more evenly spread out among a greater number of different categories. Um, and the entropy scores themselves are quite widely dis distributed. And this is an example of a user who has zero entropy. She's completely focused on one category, and that's dogs, right? So all um, possibly thousands of answers that she's provided, right, given that she has uh, over 3,000 points, are in the dog category. And here's a user who's uh, very high entropy because he's willing to talk about not just current events and law and ethics and somewhere is politics and religion, but also, you know, singles and dating and uh, infectious diseases, right? So, so really anything goes with this user. And then the question is, so it was, you weren't able to see this, but both of these users have 7% best answer. This means that when they go and answer, their answer is selected as best 7% of the time. So is it really the case that it doesn't matter that that one user, you know, really focused on dogs? Shouldn't she have been really good at answering dog questions, right? Versus the other person who's kind of all over the place, how could he possibly be expert in all those things? So we looked at this combined entropy, and we actually found that indeed it was uncorrelated with the performance, the percent best answers given. And so we're stumped a little bit about that. But then we looked at several top level categories and looked at how focused users were within those um, categories, so in the second level categories. And if you look at computers and internet and science and math, there's actually significant negative correlation between entropy and percent best answers given. Meaning that if you're only answering astronomy questions versus astronomy and biology and I know math and whatever else, right, you're going to tend to do better. This is a little bit still present in, in that middle category of categories, right, middle cluster of ca categories, and completely absent in the discussion categories. So, so focus did matter, but mostly in the kind of factual technical um, space. 
we looked at some simpler variables, and this was you know, pretty much in desperation after we found that our you know, kind of page rank and such weren't doing much. Um, so one thing that did matter was the length of the reply. Typically, lengthier answers were selecting as best, selected as best. And I should, I should mention that you know, giving a best answer just means that the asker thought that it was the best answer. But this is the person who, you know, a couple of hours ago didn't know what the answer was, and now is deciding what the best answer is. So, yeah. So the community can also write best answers? Is that true? Um, yeah, only if the asker doesn't select one. Is that included in these? No, no. We, did, we, we just, we, we actually conflated the two. So it was, for, most so we just took the best answer either as rated by the asker or as voted by the other users, but we didn't analyze them separately. Um, yeah. How often does the asker actually choose the best answer? Is that common? It's common because you get points for doing that. So can I get incentive? Yeah. Okay. So besides um, the length of the reply. We looked at for a particular answer, we were trying to predict whether it's going to be the best answer or not. And so we looked at the answer length, but we also looked at how many other answers were given, right? which kind of diminishes the chances of this particular answer being chosen. And for the user, the number of previous best answers that they gave and the previous answers. So basically, you want more best answers and fewer answers in total. And it's not, I mean, so, so this was a setup where we had you know, a 50-50 chance of being right. So we can do a bit better than 50-50. Um, but the interesting thing is that this difference in um, how well we can predict between programming marriage and wrestling is actually pretty much due to the past history of the user. So the past history is more informative in the programming category than in these other categories. So somewhat consistent with, you know, focus also matters in this category and things of that sort. Okay, so Yahoo Answers, we, we um, so there's a researcher, Eckhart, Eckhart Walther, who says, you know, the great thing about Yahoo Answers is that everyone knows something and, you know, it's a culture of generosity and everyone's sharing. And we said, okay, sure, everyone knows something. <laughs> but we weren't very well able to figure out who knew what or how well. Um, but we did see that the user interactions differed by category. We saw that some users were more focused than others and that this mattered for factual categories. And then we saw just simple metrics such as the answer length could help you predict what the best answer was going to be. So I know, how long do I go? Um, I think you have 10, 15 minutes. Okay, so um, let's see. I'll just breeze through WitKeys then. Um, these are sites in China, and there are a couple that are kind of trying to start here in the States where people will offer money in order to get their question answered. And these questions then, I mean, since as we just saw, people are willing to answer lots of questions for no money at all, um, these questions will tend to be of the type where you couldn't get people to do this out of the kindness of their hearts. So a lot of them are things like design a logo for my business or you know, do a mock-up of a website that I could use or help me devise a marketing strategy, something of that sort. And these are typically small um, amounts offered, a couple of bucks to maybe, maybe 50. So not, not really uh, big money. And what we wanted to know was this offering money get you better expertise? And in this case, since we didn't have a population of users who would both ask and reply, we um, constructed an expertise network such that if two users, say A and B, participate in the same task and A wins, then we draw an edge from B to A, indicating that A was more expert because they won over B. And then we looked at um, well, first of all, we looked at how many um, participants were participating in each task, and we saw that that's 
very highly skewed. And then we wanted to know, well, if you have more participants, will that get you a better solution? And the proxy we used was the expertise rank that's page rank applied to this expertise network of the winner. And yes, it was higher, even though on average, if you had more participants, the average expertise level was lower, which kind of makes sense because if lots of people can answer the question, then perhaps they're not all that expert. We also then looked at, well, OK, there's money at stake. So you want more people attempting to answer the task. Um, can you get more people simply by offering more money? And yes, you can. But there's this interesting progression. So the amount of money you offered is fairly strongly correlated with the number of people who view the task and less strongly correlated with the number of people who actually submit a solution. So you can kind of, because people uh, view and register and submit, you can kind of see them giving up at different points. And um, one final thing we looked at is just whether there's any learning, right? Especially with money at stake, you might imagine that it's worthwhile for users to learn how to win these tasks. And so one thing that differentiates the losers on all attempts from the, the winners who had won at least five times during the course of their attempts. This is just their first five attempts. They actually choose to go up against fewer others. So they're choosing less popular tasks. And so obviously kind of increasing their chances of winning. Um, and also you can see that for both of them, it seems like over time they're choosing less and less popular tasks. And if you look at these uh, users who actually managed to win, this is the, amount, the number of attempts in between wins. And so they, the amount of time tends to decrease over time slightly. Right? So there is a little bit of learning. At the same time, you have other users who are there making dozens or even you know, over 100 attempts and never winning. So um, really wide variety of, um, of behavior. So I, the last thing I'd like to talk about is something that had been bugging us this entire time, which was the question of why. You know, <laughs> why do people go there and do this uh, when, except for Wiki sites, they don't get paid, right? They get some points, but it's not like you can spend the points or exchange them for um, for anything. So. The first thing we looked at is, you know, is there really a stable core? When we look at those big nodes, right, who are answering hundreds of questions, are they always there, right? Is there kind of a stable core, a stable community? And it turns out that there's not. So this is one particular user who had answered hundreds of questions. And this is week by week how many questions they had answered. And here, there are a few segments where they're entirely absent. Right? And I don't quite remember if this was the, the grandpa or the guy who got really busy at work. So grandpa's story was that his kids had asked him to look after the grandchildren. And basically, he didn't have internet access and had to go to an internet cafe for a while you know, if he wanted to answer questions. Um, the guy who got too busy just said, you know, my, my job description changed. And all of a sudden, you know, this activity, which is basically a hobby, I couldn't pursue it as much as I wanted to. So um, then the question is, you know, just as we asked with focus, uh, you know, does focus matter? Well, does kind of being there matter? Or can you just, you know, stop in every once in a while and be just as good as the people who are there all the time? And so when we put these variables together, it turns out that the total number of active weeks is positively correlated with your performance. The number of active periods, that is how many times you kind of disappeared for a week or more, is negatively correlated. Right? So it matters not so much the total number of answers, but that you're there for a while and that you're there consistently. But still, you know, it doesn't explain that much um, of the variance. OK. And then. Um, so given that these users are highly intermittent, you might think, well, you know, if, if, if really there are a few key players and they can just disappear, right, maybe you're not able to cover all the questions that come in. So here are individual users, right, and you can see that their activity really fluctuates very, um, 
well, quite a lot. And here, the blue line is the number of questions over a span of three years. And any guesses? So if it's a three-year span, why we see these six peaks for um, C, C++? C++? Yeah? Finals? Yeah. <laughs> it basically traces the semesters. So there are lots of, lots of students asking for homework help in all of these forms. But so the, the thing to see is that the total number of answers is actually tracing the number of questions fairly well. So all of these questions are getting answered despite you know, kind of the highly intermittent nature of, of participation. So OK, finally, the why. Uh, so uh, Kevin Nam, in addition to um, doing a lot of this analysis of the crawl data, because again, we had a large crawl, um, called up the top users and basically said, you know, why do you do this? Uh, in kind of a more clever way. He wasn't just like, why do you do this? He was like, um, let's, let's look at the last answer that you posted. You know, what were you doing? Blah, blah. OK, so he did it properly. But um, so the, the most often cited reasons were altruistic. You know, I saw that there are people who needed help, and so I helped them, right? Or learning. Uh, well, my, my Java had gotten a little rusty, and I was going there because I could practice by helping others. Um, some mentioned it just as a hobby. You know, it's something I might do in front of the TV. Um, uh, some uh, mentioned business, although neighbor uh, discourages this and uh, will actually delete posts that are trying to advertise um, some sort of business. And then, this is kind of interesting, when you ask users outright whether they did it for points, they'd say, oh no, you know, I don't, I don't care about points. But then when you ask them, you know, what bothers you about the system, they'd say, oh, you know, when, when users don't offer enough points. So in a neighbor, you can actually offer up extra points for particular questions. And so, you know, obviously they care if they feel like some users don't post sufficient points. OK. Um, uh -huh. So this goes back to the original question of, um, uh-oh, the original question. Yes, whether they would like tough, tough questions. And uh, actually, they seem to be primarily uh, looking for unanswered questions, right? So that's the main criterion. You see an information need, you kind of fill it. Right? So people just can't stand unanswered questions. And if you look at the distribution, so how many questions you get per, how many answers you get per question, the you know, you, you would expect for internet phenomena for it to be very heavy-tailed, right, with some questions getting lots and lots of answers and a few, and most getting few. But really, a lot of the, a, a majority of the questions just get one or two, right? So people are kind of just targeting the unanswered questions, especially for the kind of programming categories. Okay, the other thing is that people just can't really, well, OK, first they can't stand unanswered questions, but they also can't stand incorrect answers. Right? So if they see that an answer is incorrect, they'll go in and they'll correct it. And we can actually see this in the data as well. When you have multiple answers, the last answer is usually the one that gets um, chosen as best. Right? So people kind of keep going until the, the best answer is provided. And also, you can kind of tell if you look at the expertise level of the user, if we look at the user's past history, if they're really good right, and they post an answer, it's less likely to be followed by another answer. So you can kind of get at this two ways. OK, so future work for all of these um, online question answer forms is well, how can we further augment these interfaces to, for example, match expertise? We'll first figure out if, if users want that and then see how to best go about it. Um, we want to trace replier strategies over time and how they select the, the questions, whether they improve their chances of getting best answer, whether they learn, right? So, so far, we haven't really seen evidence that people improve over time, except in the Whitkey case, but you know, we're, still, we're still looking. And then when uh, Kevin interviewed those participants in Naver, they actually did not mention any sort of sense of community there. They, they said they didn't know others, uh, the other top repliers. So we're kind of going to look at whether there are any forms where there is more of a sense of a community. Oh, 
Okay, sorry. <laughs> I have a little uh, blurb. Are you guys all too old for applying to PhD programs? Okay, sorry. So uh, <laughs> I'd just like to thank my um, collaborators, and, and that's that. Thanks. So we have some time for questions now. And we have a tradition here that uh, a student asks the first question. If there are any students who want to ask questions. Uh, you talked about the future of work, how you're going to try to augment this into um, forms in the future. But are there, do you know of any communities that are trying to I actually don't know of of such systems. I mean, the ones that we've studied are these really popular um, systems. There are some that will discourage newbie questions. Um, so I think, uh, let's see, I want to say Metafilter, but I'm not, it, that doesn't sound quite right. But there is an online question answer site where they basically say, oh yeah, I think it is Ask Metafilter. Um, you know, don't, don't post your question if it could just be Googled or something like that, which is kind of in contrast to what you see uh, for lots of these sites where people are in fact glad to be able to easily Google something and then, and then post the question. But I, pretty much all we've seen is kind of most recent uh, first, as far as the order in which you see things. There, I mean, so when you have things broken down by category, you can subscribe to certain categories. Um, and so at least get topically relevant questions. So uh, maybe you put this chart up uh, at some point. But I was wondering, I guess, a little bit about the distribution of the expertise in something like Java, because I feel like mm -hmm. um, you're likely to sort of get a, a more, a, like more of a dichotomy between students uh, and something like Java, people who know, versus I was wondering if you've looked at forums where, um, like I know my personal experience, forums about um, learning about Linux, for example, mm -hmm. it's very much a hobby-oriented there's going to be less of a dichotomy, more like, I feel like as I've worked through the forums, like when I started, I knew nothing, and now I can answer some questions, but I'm still certainly asking a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. I, I was wondering if you, if you thought about looking at uh, things where there might be more levels, and not just students and masters. Yeah, so um, we'd, we'd like to. <laughs> so we're kind of thinking of, uh, of looking at some, at some Microsoft forums, which should have the range, right, from people who are like, you know, oh, you know, my machine's broken, to people who are really tinkering with it. And it tends to be segregated by those levels. The way that we can, oh, there's, um, yeah, okay, maybe I can just doodle it. Um, but, and I didn't show these, but you can look at bow ties. For, so for the Java forum, you have, I think, something like if you, if you draw this bow tie, just like you can for the web, right? So this is the in and this is the out. So in the Java form, you actually get this strongly connected component. It's kind of a generalized reciprocity core where, you know, even if A helped B and maybe B didn't help A, but B helped C who helped A or something like that. So you get these kind, um, kinds of interactions in a technical forum like Java forum, which might s somewhat resemble the Linux forum. But if you look at something like Yahoo Answers, basically you have no strongly connected component. You get, um, well, out, OK, sometimes these edges are reversed. But basically, you have like a huge askers part of the bow tie, and then you have a small, you know, a small number of repliers who are basically just replying right there. So I, I know it's not exactly getting at what you're saying, but we do see kind of more interactivity, at least in the technical forms. So if, if there was a place where we could see people kind of progress, I think it's more here than here. Uh -huh. 
better at it. Uh, before mm -hmm. um, anyway, I was just wondering if you're thinking about breaking this down and trying to analyze. It. No, we, we hadn't we hadn't thought of it, but I think that's a very very plausible thing to be uh, to think about. <laughs> hmm. So <laughs> I could see how one could go about it. So Eugene Achtein uh, at Emory is working on a little demo system where you can basically put in a question and it will try to discern whether this is an easily Googleable question or whether you should go and ask it on an online question answer form. So once you know what uh, kind of what which of those two categories the question falls in, you might then start to see okay, these are the people who excel in one and these are the people who excel in the other. But really you you kind of need to do the text mining in order to to figure out the type of question. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. So, <laughs> I did want to uh, pitch the PhD program at the School of Information at the University of Michigan because we have all sorts of different uh, kind of concentrations that then inform this kind of research, including HCI and social computing and incentive center design, you know, how to get people to uh, participate, plus lots of other areas. So, it's, you know, too late this year, but, you know, consider for uh, next year or whenever you're applying. So, thanks. Mm -hmm. And so now we have a 